What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Total Human Optimization Podcast. And of course, in true fashion, we're recording on Fat Tuesday, the day where everybody <laughs> in America, Louisiana, Texas especially, just throw all our diets out the window, eat a bunch of crawfish, eat whatever we can fit in our mouths, and just kind of regret it on the next day. But on this podcast, we're going to talk about creating sustainable fat loss. And with us today, we have Alex McMahon, who is a nutritional therapy practitioner and founder of Evolve Nutrition Therapy from Portland. Is yes, that sir. Right? Is that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, Portland. So welcome, it's Alex, to the show. Here. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so Portland, Oregon, man, you know, that's one place that I've always wanted to visit. But everybody says, you know, you just have like that one ray of sunshine hitting on the grass somewhere and you kind of got to go camp out there. We get it maybe three months out of the year if we're lucky. But, you know, it's okay, though. It's where, it's where 20 year olds come to retire. You know, I don't know how many people I've met that had their PhDs and were working in coffee shops. So, well, if you grew up in the 90s, everybody wanted to had a plan to retire by 30. This is true. This is true. I think everybody just kind of shortcutted it when they moved to Portland, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, not to get too quickly in and everything, but, you know, as we talk about sustainable fat loss and we talk about mm -hmm. diets and, and losing weight, a lot of that has to do with your surroundings. And I, I know this in Austin, Texas, it's a very fit city, but there's so much food around us and there's so much great beers and all types of things. It, it makes things a little tough. Now in, in Portland, like you said, and I don't know, I mean, if you live there, I guess you kind of like the weather, the dreary weather, you know, rainy days. But I would think that has some kind of a little impact on how people eat. Well, that's one of the biggest things that I think is, uh, you know, definitely in Portland, we have a strong coffee and beer culture for sure and a pretty strong food culture as well. But the great thing about living in a place as open-minded as Portland is, is uh, you have a really hard time going any place and not finding an option that meets what your specific needs are. Plus, I also believe there's a there's a time and a place to kick your heels up and enjoy life. You know, it can't all be broccoli and chicken breast. So, no, that's definitely not true. And then, <laughs> you know, as we all know, Super Bowl the Super Bowl was this a uh, couple of days ago, and and I'm sure nobody was eating chicken and broccoli except maybe Mike Dolce. Um, <laughs> he's probably the only one that was eating chicken and broccoli on Super Bowl Sunday. But um, you know, you get you have to enjoy life. But you know, we all have goals, and we all. Mm -hmm. You know, and we all have to take care of ourselves in this one meat sack that we have. And, you know, we have to do the best that we can. So the, the, I think the biggest problem everybody has, and this is, goes on for everybody, is, you know, there's a lot of crash dieting going on in this country. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to try this one thing. And then you get bored for one week. And then you want to try this other thing. And maybe you do two weeks if you're lucky and you didn't cheat. But everybody you know, most of the time will fall off unless they have a solid plan. And, and, you know, it's something that's sustainable. So let's talk about crash diets for a second. Absolutely. Um, because you see all these things like Weight Watchers and, and who knows what else. I think I saw Oprah on an ad um, this morning talking about how she lost 20 pounds and she was able to eat bread every single day. And she was so excited and happy about it. But, um, <laughs> You know, that's not sustainable. So let's talk about crash diets. Um, you know, what what are there some some of the things that you've learned about crash dieting and the effect on actually creating a sustainable fat loss? Uh, one of the biggest things is just kind of being patient. So people typically come from a place of either being uh, patient or desperate. And when someone's really desperate for fat loss, they've kind of been sold the idea by the fitness industry that it can happen overnight. But, you know, when you look at someone who's lean and who's muscular, I think everybody needs to realize that, that that takes time to build and people are kind of looking for the magic bullet, but the real magic bullet comes in consistency, dedication, and just kind of being patient. And I, I think another big aspect is people don't really have the right tools to measure progress. So people will hop on or off a scale every day and let that scale weight directly impact how they feel about themselves. I mean, even if the scale's down, if the next day it's up, you know, that, that feeling that they yeah, had. And that might've just been, scale weight you just last. had a yeah, and that might have been you just you just had a big poop or something. Exactly. And yeah. Five pounds is your bust. <laughs> exactly. Or it could be like salt, or you had a lot of carbohydrates that day, or maybe you didn't sleep enough and you're a little inflamed or something like that. But I, I think the biggest thing is that when you when you develop more sustainable habits, the thing is you give yourself the opportunity to celebrate a win every single day, which is awesome. You know, that's a big part of what I do with my own clients is I help them to develop these sustainable habits 
to the point where they're so confident about it that when we start doing habit stacking, which is where you get one habit in place, do it for a few weeks, get it solid, and then get another one on top of it, they feel more confident towards the whole overall process than they do just the diet aspect of it. They feel ready to start taking on different aspects, you know, such as stress management or as sleep or as, you know, exercise and things like that. Yeah. I think the biggest problem as, as human beings is we just, our, our palate of taste, you know, we always want something different, Mm -hmm. you know, we're as animals, you know, dogs, cats, whatever, you know, they can eat the same thing every day. It, and, they go to it. It's a source of food. It's a source of energy. And that's the end of it. And the, I think the biggest struggle is just we're human. We have that, that, that brain that tells you, oh, this thing is so delicious. And, oh, I already had that. I don't want to have that again. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You know, the reward center in our brain was set up from a pretty evolutionary perspective to be an advantage because certain foods were only around at certain times during the year for us. But now that we have such wide food availability, you know, you can have a Mexi- you can have a banana from Mexico if you want in the dead of winter here in Portland. It doesn't really matter, you know. So we've kind of figured out a way to, to uh, you know, leap over that evolutionary system that's set up and kind of have these foods whenever we want. It's created a little bit of problem in our uh, physiology these days and our kind of disease state that we have. Yeah, and I think when, when people go on these crash diets and stuff like that, there there has to be some kind of of damage that's being done, whether it be, you know, I think one of the things uh, that I meant that you mentioned in your article that you wrote for us is, is uh, the metabolic damage and, and, and how it changes that. Yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about me- metabolic damage and, and what's going on there. Yeah. So essentially what can happen is when you're um, currently under eating, so you're eating way fewer calories than your body actually needs. A lot of people think that this is the way to lose weight, and it will happen for a period of time. But looking beyond that, um, your body's pretty smart. Your body will kind of catch on to the game that you're playing, and so it will lower the amount of calories that you're burning. So even at rest, you'll be burning fewer calories. Um, You'll notice things like people will fidget less and do things like that. And also, even when you're exercising, you'll burn fewer calories, and that's your body's way of kind of preserving the stored energy that you have on you by essentially saying, well, if less is coming in, then less is going out. And so people find themselves doing things like eating 1,200 calorie diets, and then, you know, they stall out. So then they think the next logical thing to do is to go down to 1,100 and then 1,000 calories. And suddenly, you know, your, your body's in such a state of stress from not getting enough food and over-exercising that things like libido start to get disrupted. No, you know, don't, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. So your, your body's essentially giving you the signal when it decreases your libido that you're not healthy enough right now to, to bear a child. So we're not even going to worry about that right now. So it, yeah. it, it creates a whole host of problems. And then, you know, typically it's accompanied by eating less. Uh, if your sleep is disrupted and then your libido is impacted, eventually you're going to binge. And now with that lower metabolic rate, when you do binge on those foods, it means that a much greater amount of them is actually going to be stored as body fat. Okay, so you're telling me that if I do an entire week of perfectly clean eating, I exercise my butt off every single day, I'm, I'm drinking all the water, getting enough sleep, but then come Sunday I eat a whole large pizza and chicken wings and, and maybe like a six-pack of beer, um, it's going to have worse a worse effect than if I hadn't done all those things in the beginning. <laughs> that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> Now, okay, that's again, not on top of that, though, <laughs> well, on top of that, though, what we need to talk about, though, is it, there's a difference between eating clean and eating enough. That's a thing. Is that if you're if you're under eating for the whole week, and then you take those calories and you dump them on top on, on a once a week basis, that's probably not going to have a big impact. But what I'm talking more about is if the person's been in a prolonged state of caloric restriction and then have that big binge, that is when it will be more readily stored as body fat. So. I guess, I guess the answer to your question would be it wouldn't be nearly as bad because the thing is when, when people have that metabolic damage, it's usually due to either um, eating too little or the wrong kinds of foods for a long period of time. And that's what kind of sends them down that, uh, down that hole. Okay. So what are some ways that we can figure out exactly how much we should be eating? Because, you know, as you know, most of the philosophy goes is, you know, just if you want to lose, want to lose weight, you, you restrict calories. Um, but you know, 
everybody's training is different. Some people might just be restricting calories and not doing any training, which is probably not the best idea. And then you have the opposite end of the spectrum where somebody's killing themselves every single day in the gym and, Mm -hmm. and not replacing any of those calories, you know, for building muscle or whatever. So what are some ways that we can kind of figure out where we need to be in, in our eating? So for that, there's kind of two different routes that I have people use. Um, one of them are people that I know who like to track and it's something that hasn't become obsessive for them. And the other folks are the people that don't want to track anything. So typically for that, what I'll have people do is kind of make sure that their meals are centered around a solid source of protein. So for the people who don't want to track, using your palm as kind of your guide there. So you use for uh, people mostly one to two palm sized portions of protein. And then around that, you would have more of a fist size portion of uh, vegetables around the around the plate, so it would probably be about one to two. And then based on the person's activity level and their uh, level of leanness that they're already at, usually starches could be one to two uh, open cupped hand sized uh, portions of that. And then for fat, I'd usually go for either oils that you're cooking with or just plain added fat to a meal because it's a necessity. I would go with a one to two thumbs worth of fat at each meal. And that's, that's a pretty solid start for a lot of people to start getting mm-hmm. some progress. Um, but for a lot of other people, the folks who do really enjoy tracking, you know, calories, macronutrients, all that kind of stuff, uh, a good starting place for a lot of people is 12 calories per pound of body fat and then start, or I'm sorry, per, per uh, pound in weight or per pound of body weight, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and then from there, usually using some kind of breakdown such as 0.7 to 1 gram uh, per pound of body weight for protein and then using anywhere from, you know, uh, 0.3 to 0.35 times their pounds, uh, times their total calories, I'm sorry, to gauge their fat. And then uh, carbohydrates would typically be the rest. So there's there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat kind of based on how the person wants to go about doing that. And I think that for some people, the tracking is good because it gives them something to shoot for. But then I think that there's also other people where the tracking maybe isn't the healthiest way for them to do it from a mental standpoint. Yeah, I think when it, you know, I, I like the way you're explaining a little bit better because that just that because you can take that anywhere with you. Mm-hmm. You can you can go to go out to eat whatever and, and and figure it out with with that method. Whereas you have the apps and everything with the meal logging. If you go out to eat, you may not get an accurate count on on what you order. Absolutely. Um, um and there's all types of outside factors, and then. You know, I kind of feel when you do the app tracking thing, it kind of just turns you into a robot and makes life not fun whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, it gets pretty obsessive for a lot of people. Yeah, and then, you know, if you have, you know, if you have, maybe you say you have like 200 calories left in a day and, you know, you see a cookie there on the on the, on the the counter and you're like, you know what, I have that 200 calories. I should treat myself and enjoy exactly. that Exactly. You earned it. <laughs> yeah, you didn't, <laughs> but you know, that, that, that's a, that's a really cool method. And, and I, I, you know, I'm definitely going to definitely try that one out. That's cool. So, you know, we were talking about those, you know, the, the differences in the proteins and the vegetables. I mean, does it always have to be protein and vegetables? I think you mentioned some starchy carbs in there. Like, is yeah, absolutely. There any carbs in our diets? If we want to have uh, sustainable fat loss. Oh, can you say that one more time? I lost you for a sec. Is, it, is there any room for carbs in our diet for sustainable fat loss? Like, can we have some carbs? Can we oh, have some bread like Oprah? <laughs> I think that there definitely is room for uh, carbs with fat loss. And it kind of goes back to what I was talking about a little bit before about there's multiple ways to achieve fat loss. You know, that's, that's the great thing about it is you see people who achieve it using all sorts of different methods. What I'm really interested in is finding the method for individual people that works the best for them. Because, you know, the thing is, there is no one size fits all when it comes to nutrition. There are people who do great eating a low carb diet. There are people who feel horrible eating a low carb diet. And it just kind of comes down to what fits their physiology and their personal constitution the best. But I definitely believe that there is room for carbohydrates when it comes to sustainable fat loss for sure. But I do think that the kind of carbohydrate also matters more in some cases than just the carb count. Okay. So, you know, that, that's definitely a good, a good first step, but let's talk about the other end of the spectrum. Now Mm -hmm. the exercise part of the spectrum, a lot of people in, in, in this, in this world think that just going for a run is going to do it for you, but there's a better way you can do that. And that's by building muscle, right? 
Absolutely. So um, two favorite forms when it comes to helping people to lose fat are actually um, lifting heavy weights and sprints a few times a week. So just from the basic standpoint of, um, you know, muscle has a greater mitochondrial density. So what that means is that the mitochondria are essentially the powerhouses of all of our cells. So they take the food that we eat and they turn it into energy for us to use. So because muscle has so many more of this mitochondria, the more muscle we have, the greater our need for calories to maintain that muscle is going to be essentially. So also on top of that, uh, lifting heavy weights helps to um, make you more carb sensitive. So it means that your body will be able to partition and use those carbohydrates a lot more efficiently and less of them will be, there'll be less of a likelihood of any of them being stored as body fat. And the majority of them will be used to, um, you know, replenish glycogen stores that you've burned up with doing deadlifts or dips or anything like that. And uh, another added benefit is, uh, you know, lifting heavy weights has been positively correlated to an improved hormonal profile and also helps with people getting better sleep, which is a huge, huge missing factor for a lot of people when it comes to sustainable fat loss, for sure. Okay. And getting on to that sleep part, um, is it the standard eight hours like everybody? You, you know, one, I'll tell you one thing that I started doing and well, it's actually um, made me a little bit late for work sometimes, <laughs> but I've stopped setting an alarm. And mm -hmm. I say, Orlando, get in bed at by 10 o'clock at night. Just get in bed by 10 o'clock at night and don't bother setting an alarm. And I and usually if I, if I wake up early enough, if I wake up at, I have to be at work at nine, whatever, if I wake up at seven and I feel good, I go for a little morning run to get to get the juices flowing. But if, if I feel like my body needs just more sleep and, uh, you know, I, I take it. But, you know, there might be too much and obviously there's too little. Um, so, you know, how do we find where our sleep should be? I think typically the, you know, the old, uh, recommendation of about seven and a half to eight hours is pretty good. Um, I see upwards of also people who get nine still having benefits, but sometimes when people push beyond nine, they end up a little bit groggier the next day and they also feel a little bit off, but I'd say the best recommendation. Yeah. What's what, before you go further, like what is happening in that process? If you get too much sleep, like why does that make you groggy? Does it doesn't make, that doesn't make sense to me. So do you have an answer for that? For, for a lot of it, I think it could just be kind of thrown off your basic circadian rhythm. You know, there's, there's a certain time that we are kind of programmed to be awake and a time that we're programmed to be asleep. And when you throw that off, there's just going to be different shifts in the body. You know, I've, I've seen it a couple different times with people who are shift workers who worked late at night, you know, their whole circadian rhythm totally shifted and the time when their body would secrete certain hormones and, uh, you know, would help them wake up or fall asleep naturally actually shifted to meet that. So um, if I had to guess, I would say it would probably have to be due to a shift in the circadian rhythm, but it could also just be, you know, too much sleep. It could be that your body's overcompensating for something. Yeah. And we, you know, when we, when we think about the, the sleep portion and, you know, if, if you don't get a good night's sleep, we've all had mm -hmm. this before. We have a, if you live in an apartment, you have a loud neighbor, maybe a, a dog that's kept you up all night, or maybe, you know, something, you know, in your, in your personal life is keeping you awake. You know, you, you get stressed out now yeah. and stress. That's, that's the big guy that always is in the little back pocket of keeping you losing fat. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the biggest things is that, uh, the stress that we are kind of more designed to handle is the acute stress where we have a stressful situation, we either fight or flee from it. And then we have a time of recovery where we've actually used up those stress hormones like cortisol, and we've actually burned up all the sugar and the fuel sources that we've mobilized to help deal with that. What we're not really designed to handle is what we encounter every single day, which is the chronic low grade stressors kind of all day long. And what that does is it causes the frequent uh, secretion of the stress hormone cortisol, and I don't want to paint cortisol out to be a bad guy because you actually do need it. It's what helps you wake up. It's what helps you be alert when you wake up and things like that. But just like so many things um, in the human body, it's all about balance and the poison is definitely in the dose when it comes to it. So when you have an overproduction of cortisol, what happens is your body goes into more of a uh, catabolic phase, or I'm sorry, a uh, catabolic phase where all the, all the energy is shifted from building things up and it's more shifted to breaking things down. So that's why people who are overly stressed will kind of have some of the uh, skinny fat look to them is because muscle will be tapped into. 
Um, another problem with it is that when you have an over secretion of cortisol and it's just happening all the time, will, uh, your body will engage in what's called the uh, pregnenolone steel, where you have a number of other hormones, uh, you know, such as testosterone, DHEA, uh, estrogen, and um, progesterone. And because your body says we can't keep up with the needs of secreting this stress hormone cortisol, we're going to steal the precursors from these other areas and these other hormones because, you know, keeping you alive from moment to moment is prioritized over making testosterone or making estrogen or anything like that. So you'll, you'll actually see people who have a severe dip in uh, the hormonal profile when they're just overly stressed all the time. Yeah, man. There's just like there's so many things that go into creating the <laughs> formula to being a fit person. It can really be like, it can be a little stressful in itself <laughs> just trying to figure it all Absolutely. out. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I guess you just kind of have to do it. Now, I, I think in you know I've always I've always been told that, that stress is a big part of this, but I think most everybody has a problem burning the fat that they hate the most, which is around the belly. Mm -hmm. So is is there besides just following a normal plan is there anything we can do to just kind of help in that area get because that's where like it seems like that's where the last the last of the fat remains all the time it, it is you know and uh from the clients that i've worked with the best progress that we've had you know sometimes you'll do a dietary intervention you can't get that belly fat to come off uh sleep and stress management are the two biggest things that I've seen kind of melt that lower ba uh, belly fat away for a lot of people. And it, it's been pretty interesting because I'm known as the nutrition person, but as I'm in this more, I realize that nutrition is a huge component, but you know, stress, exercise, um, sleep are also such big parts. You can't really address one without addressing the other. So it, it, it gets a little funny when you get in there and look at it and you know, people are meeting with me for nutrition consultations and I end up telling them that, you know, we're going to start dialing back on their screen time at night or I'd like to go for a 20 minute walk in the morning or something like that and relax because it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with nutrition. But with regards to sleep and uh, stress management, those are the two biggest things that I've seen that really take away that lower belly fat for a lot of people. Yeah. And, you know, in, in another thing that, that I think that, that that's kind of changed you know, as, we, as we've uh, progressed over time in our, in our scientific advances, do you remember, and this isn't too long ago, do you remember the days when when all fat was bad for you? When having, Absolutely. having egg yolks was going to give you a heart attack? You know, like, but now we're realizing we need healthy fats. And now people are, now there's different types of fats. It's not all the same thing. Yeah. So, so for people that still don't understand What's the difference between a healthy fat and a bad fat? And what are the two doing to you? So uh, the biggest correlation that I can make that's pretty easy for a lot of people to understand is uh, good fats come from nature and bad fats are made in factories. So one of the huge aspects of healthy fats is they provide your body a longer burning source of fuel. So typically, you know, in the absence of carbohydrates, your body will turn to both body fat and dietary fat as an alternative source of uh, fuel that kind of burns a little bit longer. It also means that, um, you know, when you have fat in the diet with your meals, it slows the gastric emptying of your stomach. So the actual contents of your stomach empty out slower, which means that your body has an easier time kind of regulating energy and you won't experience those huge blood sugar spikes. So for someone who is a little bit more carb sensitive, adding in sources of healthy fat can make it so that their blood sugar levels don't fluctuate as high and as low as they normally would. Okay, cool. And, and then um, do yeah, you want me to talk a little bit on the, uh, the bad fats? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, when it comes to bad fats, pretty much any kind of vegetable oil, you know, canola oil, anything that's hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil are gonna typically be a fat that you would wanna stay away from. Um, the, the main reason is that they're polyunsaturated fats, so they're pretty susceptible to heat damage. So um, through the process of turning them into vegetable oil, they're, they're heated at very high temperatures, and that already kind of damages the structure of their fat because they have many open bonds. So uh, you have monounsaturated, which means essentially uh, one open bond. You have polyunsaturated, which means you know many open bonds. And then you have saturated, which means there's no open bonds on that fat molecule. So when you have the polyunsaturated ones, because they don't have as many bonds that are filled, they're more susceptible to heat damage. 
So when you take those fats and you cook with them, they actually become slightly carcinogenic because they're so easily oxidized and damaged by heat that when someone cooks with it, they're only kind of furthering that problem. Wow. That's a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me, man, I have to keep it all in my head. Yeah. And the, the, the funny thing is that, you know, uh, in, in nutrition, when you look at it, you go, the more you know, the less you know. And it's crazy to think in those regards because, I mean, we're just now figuring out parts about our microbiome and our gut and our brain that we hadn't ever previously known. And we've had these bodies forever. So it's, it's pretty amazing and exciting because I feel like there's, you know, you're never really done learning. You're always having to be on top of it. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the oils, when you're cooking at home, what kind of oils are you using? So when it comes to anything that is going to be, you know, like medium to high heat, I'll go with a, a grass fed butter or a coconut oil. And then when it comes to anything that I'm using for like a cold source or a topping, I'll typically do olive oil and macadamia nut oil or uh, avocado oil. And those three are all pretty solid ones to use cold or if you'd like to, I know a lot of people are still very much so in, in um, you know, cooking with olive oil, just use it at a lower heat and you'll be fine. The biggest thing is when you start to cook it at like, you know, the medium, medium high temperature, that's when you can start to kind of damage those fats. Yeah. You know, it, it's still, it's still to this day because, um, and I, I think about this all the time because um, gr growing up, my dad had heart disease and mm -hmm. I remember all the time, you know, his whole, the whole thing in the house was, you know, he can't eat butter at mm -hmm. all. So, so we had the, the Fabio endorsed. I can't believe it's not butter in the house. Um, that's what we, that's what we would use to butter toast, whatever. And I just, I think back to that time of how like stressed out and how like, and how crazy my dad and my mom were about making sure we don't have butter in the house. And now like people are adding it to their food and throwing it in shakes. It's like back on the menu. Where did, where did this happen? <laughs> and where did this all get misconstrued? <laughs> so I think it was just kind of bad science is what it came down to. Um, you know, a long time ago, they looked at the role of, you know, saturated fat and heart disease and things like that. And it was just kind of bad science interpreted the wrong way. And then a lot of people went and kind of backed it. And so, you know, a long time ago, Ansel Keys looked at it and he looked at people who actually had a familial high cholesterol. And he also noticed that they ate, you know, significant amounts of saturated fat. And so he started to kind of connect some dots. And then when he found that, um, when he found a connection between saturated fat and heart disease, from there, a lot of what he did was he handpicked data. So he went and looked into something, I think upwards of like 17 different countries and he picked the data that supported um, his basic claims and then kind of rejected the other ones. So the, the actual data was all over the place. There were you know, places that ate high amounts of saturated fat and had little to no cardiovascular disease. And then there were also some that did support him. But I think that w when you look at heart disease, it goes a lot deeper than just the fat that you're eating. I think it comes down to, at a base level, um, a lot of it has to come back to inflammation in the body. And some of the things that cause inflammation in the body are going to be, you know, too many processed carbohydrates and sugars. It's going to be stress. It's going to be not getting enough sleep. You know, it, it's pretty much the standard American way of life is what creates inflammation in the body. And I think that that's a much, yeah, <laughs> who would have thought, right? It's, that's a much dr larger driver of, you know, cardiovascular disease than saturated fat from, you know, coconut oil and butter. Yeah, man, all, cr all, all crazy things, but you know, I, I guarantee you from tonight, I'm going to try to go to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to relax, maybe meditate a little bit before bed and do it, and, um, you know, and, and, uh, make sure that I'm eating those, those, those good fats. So when, when somebody makes the decision like, Hey, and I'm sure you've had this with your clients and mm -hmm. they're going to go full force. Like, you know, I'm going to reach my goals. I'm going to, I'm going to burn off all this excess fat and I'm going to, I'm going to keep it that way. Um, What's a good way to create a a good a good way to create a plan to to start with? Um, l l let's do it this way. If, if you're a let's start with a beginner. If they're a beginner getting into this, they haven't really done any anything at all. Um, what's mm -hmm. a good way to start? And then after that, let's explain for somebody that might already be kind of in motion, and, but they feel like they might have kind of plateaued and and they need help to to get a little further to their goal. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, man. Um, so when it comes to people starting off who want to alter their nutrition, the biggest thing that I have them do is look at their day and say, what day 
what, what time of day and what meal would be the easiest for them to make a change to. So right there, always what I'm trying to do is remove stress from the situation. It's what's going to be the easiest change for that person that's going to have kind of the largest impact for them. And so for a lot of people, it's, you know, drinking a couple extra glasses of water. It could be having some extra vegetables at a certain meal. For a lot of people who find themselves hungry all the time, it could be adding a little bit more um, fat to a specific meal and then reducing a little bit of the processed carbohydrates. So I have a person look at the current time of day and the meal where they would have the greatest, um, greatest chance of having success. And then from there, I take a look at that meal and we see what, what they're doing really well with that meal. Because the thing is, you have to always make sure that you catch somebody doing something right. You know, That's the thing is everybody likes to feel encouraged and everybody likes to feel like um, they're doing something positive. So you go, okay, well, this is what you're doing so far that's positive and we're gonna keep that and we're gonna make a small tweak to this. And then from there, a big part of what I do is it's not just me telling them what they're gonna do. We have a conversation about it. So I ask them on a scale of one to 10, how positive are you that you could do this 90% of the time? And if it's anything less than an eight, we make a readjustment to it because I want that person to feel confident that they can do it. Almost a little bit like braggadocious, like it's too easy for them. And the thing is, you get somebody started on the path like that and they start to develop that confidence. And then once they see progress happening, that's when they start to feel a little bit more patient with the whole process. So from there, what I typically do is we take that one meal that they're able to change and then we kind of start reverse engineering to the next easiest and to the last easiest. And then you can kind of cycle back and start making other changes to all the meals until you kind of have the meals set up in a way that's conducive to that person's life and their goals. Cool. And then what about that person that's that is putting all the work and has made significant progress, but yeah. there's something just stopped it and you, they can't get to that next level. So for that person, typically what I'll have them do is uh, track their food intake for a few days. And so that could be on a food journal. It could be using something like MyFitnessPal, but they just do it for a few days to see where they're really at. Because for a lot of people, um, they're actually eating a lot more than they would assume. You know, the funny thing is prepackaged foods can be, um, I think it's, they can contain upwards of 20% more calories than are actually listed on the package. And that's been noted on the FDA's website. So they could be consuming on a daily basis, but a lot of their foods are coming out of packages. They could be eating upwards of, you know, like 20 to 30% more than they think they are on a, on a daily basis. So I have them track and then take kind of a snapshot of that. So see where their calories are at, see how many grams of carbs, fat, and protein they have going on. And then for there, you take a look at that and you start making little adjustments. So it could be they pull out, you know, 10 grams of carbs and five grams of fat and that's it. And that's the only adjustment they make for a few weeks. And then once progress picks up again, they start making those little tweaks to make it happen. Now, if the person's a little bit beyond that, what I would have them do is take a look at their stress management, their sleep, you know, anything like that, I think are going to be really big returns on investment. Also, another thing is taking a look at your exercise. If you are trying to exercise like a professional athlete and you don't have the time to recover like one, you probably shouldn't be. You know, so some, some people like to exercise like a, like a bat out of hell at the gym, but they're not sleeping, they're not eating the right foods, and then they do all these other things that would, you know, amplify their benefits, but they're just, they don't prioritize it. So then you take a look at that, you go, are you sleeping those seven and a half to eight hours? Are you, you know, doing some form of stress management? It doesn't have to be meditation, it could be a walk in the morning, it could be reading or listening to a song or a podcast that you enjoy, or are you just taking some time out of the day for yourself to relax and just kind of, you know, enjoy yourself, you know, have it be your time. And then on top of that, you know, are you doing way more than you need to, to lose fat? Because the thing is, people always assume more is better. It isn't always the case. I, I had a client who I worked with and uh, he, he was the bouncer. So he had a very high stress job to begin with. But then on top of that, he would always be up until about four or five in the morning. And his, his diet was actually pretty good. And then we looked at his exercise. That was the glaring thing was he was going to the gym and lifting heavy for like two hours and then trying to do, you know, a 30 or 40 minute circuit. And I said, for the next two weeks, these are the dietary changes I want you to make. Go to the gym and lift heavy, keep it an hour max. And then I want you to take your walk, your dog on three 30 minute walks per day. And you should have seen the look that this guy gave me. But, you know, two months later, he has a six pack and I'm, and the, yeah. the proof was kind of in the pudding there. And it was the fact that he was actually just doing too much. He wasn't recovering well enough from what he was given his body in terms of stresses to deal with. 
<laughs> so, there's, there's like so much to think about and there, there's so many ways to do things and it's just it can it could be a little much sometimes but i think you Absolutely. ruined my weekend so <laughs> <laughs> oh man now okay so you, you made it a lot easier so um uh, we, you know, I think I think that's the big part too. Is people on the other end spectrum, they think, oh, I'm not, I'm hitting this plateau, and I maybe I need to add another workout in the morning or something. But mm -hmm. it, it could be just some little changes. You don't have to, you don't have to add another hour of of pure hell in the gym to to get that yeah. done. But and, um, you know, yeah. for some people, another aspect that can be kind of helpful is taking a look at what your needs are on the specific days where you work really hard in the gym. So it could be you go to the gym and lift and sprint, you know, three to four times a week. And for those days, maybe you eat more calories and you have a greater amount of carbohydrates to kind of fuel that exercise and then also the recovery. But then on the days where you're resting, you kind of lower the carbohydrates a little bit and have your body turn to fat more as a fuel source there. And you have a little bit of a calorie split between the days where you're more active and the days where you're less active. That sounds beautiful. But <laughs> here's the other part. And this is a big thing. It's like, how do we deal with the people around us, the friends who want us to go out and go have drinks? And hey, you know, you've been working too hard. You know, you need to enjoy yourself, your life a little bit. You know, what do we do with those guys? You, you know, how do we, how, what are some ways we can make them kind of understand what we're trying to do and, and help them get them on our side? <laughs> So one of the big things that's really important to a lot of people is having that kind of accountability and the social support. So I found with people who had, you know, spouses or um, someone who was important in their life who wasn't quite on board, when they pull that person aside, they say, hey, you know, these are what my goals are. I'm really serious about it. And I need you to kind of support me in that. When they were brutally honest with those people and told them, I need your support to be able to do this because you not being on board is kind of hurting me right now and it's hindering my progress and I want this for myself, those other people were pretty receptive to it, you know? Um, but then also on the flip side of it, things like kind of just stick into your guns for a while and eventually people kind of get the hint. So for me, when I started to change how I ate at all my, so at all my family gatherings, you know, Everybody thought I was the weirdo. Everybody was like, oh, Alex is the one who's, you know, not eating bread or he's passing up on this or that. And for a period of time, it was weird to them. But now it's just the, kind of the norm. And, you know, when something's worth it, I kick my heels up and I enjoy myself. But, you know, the thing is, I think that there's a time and a place for those drinks and for those celebrations. But if you're doing it all the time, it kind of takes away from the significance and um, how much more special they can be when you do actually feel like you've earned them and kick your heels up. Yeah, and guess what? Once they see how much of a transformation you've had and how great you look and how great you're feeling, guess who the, pers the first person they're going to go to for advice is? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been a really cool thing for me is, uh, you know, in, in my family, I'm the person who folks talk to now about that. So, you know, my cousins or my mom or my dad, when they have something, you know, obviously I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on TV. But uh, when they have something that pertains around nutrition or health, I'm usually one of the first people that they call, which is, it, it feels good. Yeah, that's awesome. So, ton of great information. Everybody can take something from this podcast, I feel. I know I'm going to take a lot from it. I'm going <laughs> to start changing the, the way I do some things. I'm going to give myself a little bit more rest time. Um, that, yeah. That's one of my personal things. Um, um, and definitely uh, follow some of the other advice. So if people want to keep up with you and, and, um, and learn a little bit more ab about some, some of your philosophies on, on this subject, um, where can they do that? So you can find me on Instagram at Evolve Nutritional Therapy. You can find me on Twitter at Evolve NTPDX or on Facebook at Evolve Nutritional Therapy LLC. And uh, it actually happens that I did something special for the On It listeners today. So I recently came out with a book called Simple Fat Loss. And it's kind of a six-month expansion on some of the ideas that Orlando and I went over today. And it kind of gives you a six-month plan that's a habit-based routine for fat loss that addresses you know, nutrition, exercise, uh, stress management, sleep, and all those things. And it's not just a here, do this. It's a here's how to do this. Do it this many times per week. Don't worry about the rest. And it's, it's been really helpful for a number of people. So with that, you get access to the uh, private Simple Fat Loss page. And then also there's, I think, 13 plus PDF documents that people can have access to. So if the Onnit listeners go to my website at evolvenutritionaltherapy.com backslash Onnit, they can find the, uh, the book there for their download for free. 
So awesome. if you want the book, go over there and grab it. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing that for uh, for everybody. I think I'm going to go ahead and go get that now too. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, make make sure I'm, I'm on the right track. And, you know, everybody also make sure to check out uh, the onit.com slash academy. Um, Alex has been writing some articles for us. Um, you'll see them appear there as well. Um, so take with that information with, uh, <laughs> take that information with what you can and, and do what you can. With a grain of salt, because salt's not bad for you. <laughs> now it's not, as long as it's Himalayan <laughs> pink salt. It's great. It's perfectly exactly. fine. <laughs> exactly. Um, tons of minerals. It's great for your body. 100%. But, um, um, again, thanks to Alex for, for all your information. Thanks so much. And thanks for giving that, uh, that, uh, that book for our, our friends here that listen to us. And um, everyone, um, please go down on iTunes and uh, write us a review. Um, tell your friends about the podcast. We want to make this the best podcast um, we can have in the in the health and fitness uh, sector of, of iTunes. Absolutely. So so go help us do that. And until next time, stay on it and peace out. Later. <laughs>